So over to you, Professor Hulin. Goi naan. That's what I'm supposed to say. Um, good evening and guten Abend. I'm proud to stand here and be able to talk to you personally. My topic seems to be rather bizarre. It's only a sentence. Information wants to be free. Who has said this sentence? John Perry Barlow. He was a strange guy. He has composed songs of the Grateful Dead in the 80s, in the earlier 70s. Um, he was an internet guru, traveling around and telling stories about what should be in the internet. <clears throat> and at a conference in 1996, he said this astonishing sentence, information wants to be free, information yearns to be free. This simple sentence caused a shock in traditional copyright law. And before you, uh, you must understand what is traditional copyright law. Traditional IP seems, um, which is taught even in Germany in most places, has a very, very big peculiar attitude. It's talking about IP. We it's mentioned several times uh, intellectual property. We call it in German Geistiges Eigentum. <clears throat> this term is so stupid. If you look to the historical traces of this term, it comes from the Prussian uh, discussion in Germany of 1835 to make the poor politicians understand what is protection of knowledge. The people invented the term intellectual property, Geistiges Eigentum. They said, um, you should protect um, copyright and creativity because that's stealing. It's stealing like normal stealing, but it's made with immaterial goods. And the stupid politicians said, oh yeah, we understand. We need to protect ourselves even in that specific area of theft. Now they are talking about intellectual property. This intellectual property has a broad scope. Uh, the standard of originality is decreasing. As when you see the history of intellectual property, from the starting point, they had high literature like Balzac or Kotze, all these now very intelligent writers, that's, for instance, copyright. But the level of originality changed during the last decades. It's decreasing. We protect simple design patterns and other stuff. We are protecting more and more under copyright. And we extend economic rights. A copyright also has moral rights. Nobody is talking about the moral rights. That's a rare topic. But about economic rights, you know, money. When you see the history, the amount of economic rights has increased. And a huge variation of economic rights Copying is forbidden, distribution is forbidden, change are forbidden, and we have a specific problem in the internet because the internet, nobody makes a really a copy, a hard copy is a rare thing. Nobody is really distributing or selling. So there's a huge discussion going on. How do we apply traditional economic rights to the internet. That especially applies to the question of RAM. RAM is not a Buddhistic sect, it's a random access memory. These, all these very um, um, temporary copies made via streaming. Can we apply principles of normal copyright law to that 
very strange copy is made when you stream. So there is a huge discussion on digital copying, whether it's copy or not, and a discussion on digital distribution. Where we can apply the traditional concept of distribution of goods as well to the internet. To tell you the story, fortunately, the European Court of Justice has not decided the matter of digital copying. We are eagerly waiting for a discussion and uh, for a decision on that matter. There is only one very nice sentence in a decision of the European Court of Justice, the famous case Kaidekoda, where the court said, what is that? Is, you cannot believe that this is copying if you're making temporary copies in a random exit memory. So I'm really happy for that sentence, but let's wait and see. Another feature of traditional IP law is very strange. We have exemptions. So if you have increased the number of rights and you are protecting more and more of objects, you should, of course, have exemptions. But in traditional IP law, these exemptions are seen ex as exceptions. That's very important to understand, because exceptions are interpreted very narrowly. So not broadly, they are exceptions. And exceptions in legal theory are rare rules which you don't apply too broadly. The enforcement is really harsh. That means we have increased the level of sanctions for violating copyright law, not copyright law, patent law. Um, the level has increased during the last decades so you get severe punishment. And Another feature, extension of duration. So the, the duration of, for instance, copyright law has um, increased really, really um, severely. When you take the Prussian, the first German legislation on copyright law, we had a protection of 10 years after the death of the author. When you see the situation now, we have 70 years, or in South Africa, 50 years, but that's a long, long time, 50 years of the death of the author. <coughs> to give you a strange feature, <coughs> software is protected by copyright law. Who, who is interested in having 70 years of the, after the death of a programmer, of a nerd, a protection <laughs> for software? The software is already dead since several decades. So it's a nasty thing to do. But <clears throat> we have even tendencies from the United States, everything which is bad is coming from the United States, <clears throat> of extending the duration. <clears throat> they have made a Mickey Mouse extension act in order to have Mickey Mouse protected for a longer period. It was an outcry in the United States because of that, but they made it. And we are obliged, as very, very obedient Europeans, to do the same thing in Europe. In traditional IP law, they have even extended the scope of neighboring rights. Neighboring rights only protect um, very, very um, minor people as a tradition. But these minor people have asked for the rights to be more and more protected. So the EU, for instance, has invented a database right. So every collection of data is protected under a sui generis right if they are, um, this database represents a high amount of work and skill and labor. <coughs> the, the newest extension of copy of neighbor rights is press. The press is very powerful in Europe. 
So they ask every time we need a specific neighboring right for protecting our interests against Google. So they have won the battle, so they have a new neighboring right in Europe for the protection of media against Google. So we see a tendency not only to protect more and more under copyright law, to extend economic rights, to give exemptions as rare exceptions, and to extend the duration and even invent new neighboring rights. But that's not all. What I think is striking under traditional IP law, they think we have nothing to do with traditional civil law. We are a little bit better. We are IP lawyers, not doing nasty things like normal contract law or property law. No, no, we would never do a lecture on these strange matters. So we are IP lawyers. That has to do on the one hand with their arrogance, but on the other hand, with the um, problem that, the, that contract law, normal contract law, includes unfair contract terms or relations. And they are fearing the traditional IP laws that these unfair contract term regulation might be applied in copyright law. So, so they invented a nice term for that. They said, we don't have a normal co um, contract, we don't have sale of rights, we don't have lease of rights in the copyright law, we have a license. If you say the word license in Münster, in my institute, you have to pay 200 rand um, in a special pocket. <laughs> because it's forbidden to say license. In, in the whole of Europe, you never find any statute which is using the word in license. It's coming from the United States again. It's an invention of IBM and Microsoft. Um, because then they can say, the unfair contract terms are English. Oh, that's not, has nothing to do with us. We are only making license. And that's not regulated in normal contract law. So they are out. You see, when you have listened to me, I'm not a fan of this traditional um, view. Therefore, I'm called our institute, Institute for Information. Welcome to that. John Pyle Barlow had the same feeling. Something is wrong. And the whole system is wrong when it comes to the inter internet. And in 1996, he made even a declaration of the independence of cyberspace. He was totally against copyright lawyers, totally against patent lawyers. He said the internet is a free place which cannot be regulated. This declaration was immediately grasped by the colleagues in Harvard, in Stanford, everywhere in the United States you could have <coughs> articles on a kind of knowledge commons. So information needs to be free, wants to be free, belongs to nobody. That was a belief in Harvard as well as in Stanford. They even trace the um, vision back to the old times of Almende. Almende was a nice term for commons uh, of, of sheep herds. They had a common ground for their sheep, which can be used by everybody. The problem with John Perry Barlow, I'm sorry to say that, he was totally wrong. And this vision that doesn't work. Why should information be free? Um, why should there is some information which wants to be paid for? So. There's no justification for the stupid sentence, information wants to be free. But what we can learn from John P. Barlow is this approach, which is our approach um, at the Institute and in several institutes 
throughout the world. We say we don't talk about IP law anymore. That's John Perry Bell. We call it information law. The main topic is the future of information. So then copyright law is only one element. Is the other um, is a very important element, but again, uh, there are other other elements like data protection, privacy that are also important uh, in the information law. Copyright law is only one element. So copyright law is an exception as such. Uh, we need to have the constitution as framework in uh, these institute like mine. We start every lecture in the IP law with tracing back the constitutional foundations of IP law. We ask ourselves how, how and why should an author be protected under the constitution. So, and if you do that, you find out a balance of rights. Because it's not only the author, it's not only, <coughs> only the user, it's a triangle. You have the author, you have a person which disguises himself, he's a distributor, the big companies. They're taking away the rights of the author, and you only see the press and the big corporation when they claim um, that creativity needs to be protected. So, and we have the user. So, our court, German Constitution Court, has made several decisions on this balance. And they say it's a balance where each right needs to be protected to the utmost. So we have to find a balance. And it's not only the author who gets the utmost protection, but um, the trader as well and the user as well. We need to balance these rights, not only one right. Sorry to say that, but then exemptions are not exceptions. That is what I really strongly believe. Never talk about exceptions when you talk about uh, anything like fair use, fair dealing, and so on. Because we have be, um, if you take the values behind um, fair use, it's always the constitutional set. It's a protection of the public to get access to certain uh, things. So an exception is only copyright law. So, but not the exemption. And then you can see with new eyes what is happening in Europe and the United States. It's a hypertrophy of new rights and sanctions. You wake up one day and you say, what are these politicians doing? They are giving more rights to more things which are protected. They reduce the number of um, exceptions. Uh, exemptions. They have invented new sanctions, new neighbor rights. That's a, a kind of hypertrophy. It means that the copyright system is exploding. And that's what is doing in Europe in this moment. You can talk to people on the street about copyright law. We never had that before. 20 years ago, everybody believed copyright law is totally boring. Never talk about us on copyright law. But now you can tr go to a pub in Borussia Dortmund and say, <coughs> um, have you heard about the new directive information society? And people say, yes, yes, I've heard a very, very big thing. So <coughs> it's a hypertrophy, an explosion of rights, which is not justified. And coming to, to that point, unfair contract terms are related. Of course. Copyright contracts are part of unfair contract terms regulation. I would never like to see um, a situation again which we had when the Federal Supreme Court said we don't have unfair contract terms regulation in copyright law, so you can take away all the rights of creators with one uh, clause in the contract. 
the court said, sorry, we cannot do anything because we don't have unfair insurance regulation. No, that's not true. We can apply unfair contract terms to regulation. I have done it as a judge three times. That was an outcry of hate against me. But um, it's perfectly okay. And never, never again. That's, if you don't want to listen to me, there's some dinner waiting outside. You can really be fond of having the dinner and wait and say, well, I don't want to listen to this German guy. He's taking rubbish. But believe in me, there is no such thing as a license. Always ask yourself, what is meant with this foggy word, license? And then you can uh, come to the solution, it's a sale of rights. That's exactly what the European Court of Justice has said in the uh, famous Ustorf case. He said, you can ride on a donkey. It's a horse. It remains a donkey. So that means you can ride on a contract, license, it doesn't matter. It's a sale or lease of rights. And we should, uh, in general, stress the link between IP law and traditional civil law. That's very important. I'm happy to say I'm not only a teacher in IP law, but as well in contract and normal property law. That's good a combination. So I'm not really afraid. I'm a little bit nervous. I wondered whether I can do it. Um, I'm a stupid German. And I will now talk to you about South African law. That's uh, um, dangerous. Uh, it's only some um, ideas that came into my mind when I had a flight here. I believe you have the most important and beautiful constitution in the world. It's a very, very good document. And when I've seen these three tables outside, I was really impressed. Because you have to love your constitution. It was very well drafted. And there you see in Article 16, freedom of expression. Everyone has a right to free, uh, freedom of expression, which includes the freedom to re receive or impart information or ideas. It's a general concept. Everybody has a little bit similar to John Perry Barlow. Information wants to be free, wants to be used. That's a fundamental right, as well as the freedom of artistic creativity. As as in the same level of protection. And if you take the German constitution court, they would say you have to balance these rights and find a solution which is good for both sides. You have um, a, a little bit strange concept of property in Article 25. I'm, I was not very sure whether property really relates to IP. In Germany, it would relate, it would say, intellectual property is property, but only for constitutional purposes. I'm not sure about South Africa. That need to be considered during my next day. You have a very strong access to information, right? Very, very strong. Even against an information that is held by another person, and that is required for the exercise of any other right. So there is a strong focus in the Constitution to give access to rights, uh, to information. That relates to, uh, to other considerations. In South Africa, the Doha Declaration space, um, plays a specific role as the declaration importantly, international um, industrial property law, um, it says you have to uh, interpret the regulations of the WIPO according to the purpose of the contract. Uh, so broadly, as a freedom to interpret um, um, international IP status. 
And that is similar to Article 39 of your Constitution. I believe the Doha Declaration in international law is only um, uh, express rules stating the same as Article 9, uh, 39. So you have to find the balance and try to read, lead every right to its optimum. I've checked all the uh, literature I could get via the internet or in the, your library. Thank you again for your library access. Um, there was one really remarkable book of Gerardus Verhoeve from 2011. He was a guy who has understood the European way of balancing fundamental rights in copyright law. So he was the first I found who really balanced his rights versus the others. Then, you must see in uh, Stellenbosch, I have found out this remarkable lady, Dennis Nicholson. Um, she was right, fighting for the rights of disabled persons in copyright law and said, you need to balance rights like the Europeans are doing. So, it's the same approach and these approaches need to be supported. So, that's all. Many things I want to say to Zadula. This was so charming. You, uh, the visit was perfect for me. I said to him, this is a visit like Stendhal, who was in the 70th century in Florence. He became sick because he was so amazed. Uh, and I feel a little bit like Stendhal. So I was so amazed. I would say the lion sleeps only in the night. So that means please wake the lion in the dead. You have really something to say in South Africa regarding your constitution and copyright law. And I would really love to see people from Nigeria, from other countries uh, be involved in a process for finding an African way to define IP law. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Smith and Professor Sadula, as I call him.